Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So before we get started, I firstly want to talk about Mr. Aspen Pittman. Aspen was an incredible talent. He was a mainstay of the Los Angeles musical community. Um, Unfortunately, he died just a little bit over three weeks ago. And at the request of his daughter, we waited until after memorial service before talking about it. Um, it was a beautiful memorial service. It was insanely packed. Um, it was a um, standing room only. Everybody that I've ever met in the music industry was there. Um, you know, Ivana Manley was there, Bruce Spinner from Desktop. There was ton, even more than that. So many incredible people. People that Aspen came up with in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, from when he was at Guitar Center, like in the early days, you know, employees and partners of his in all of his different businesses. I mean, it was a who's who of the music industry out here in California. We were all there to give thanks to such an incredible talent. Um, we did do a studio walkthrough with him about three years ago, and we also talked about his career. Um, he has some funny stories about Jimi Hendrix, and he he's just a great guy. So please go and check out that video we did. There's also a podcast. It's all free. Um, you know, we're not pitching you anything. Just check it out. The links are down there. Check out this incredible guy, um, Mr. Aspen Pittman. Um, you will be missed. Thank you ever so much for everything you did for the music industry, Aspen. Where is the best place to put a room mic when recording a rock band, along with their amps and PA in a room? That's an unusual question, but I like it because I grew up, like many of us, you know, recording bands in the most untoward circumstances. To be honest, even now I do stuff like that. We're working with an artist at the moment. We just finished her record. On her first record that we did, we went down and recorded a choir in a yoga studio. And we turned up with, you know, a pair of mics, a little tiny audience, you know, two input and a laptop. Um, then I've recorded, you know, Black Veil Brides at uh, the El Rey a couple of years ago, you know, full blown rig, you know, mics everywhere, mic in the rooms, everything. I've done it, done it all. I've been blessed to, to work with uh, recording the Ramones and the Chili Peppers and tons, just tons of live stuff. I love doing the recording and mixing of live things. However, it all comes from that first experience of recording my band. So I used to do things like take a Walkman and like plonk it in the best seating position. So you walk around the room, usually ends up somewhere in the center, you know, and you plonk down the, the Walkman where it sounds best to your ears. Now in this situation, if you're trying to capture just the whole sound of a band, which is probably what your question is, then get a pair of microphones matched if you can, you know, this is, obviously you want it to be matched and you want them to be expensive, but my guess is you're trying to figure out how to record a band in the most simplistic way. Try to get a matched pair of microphones, it can be whatever you've got, and put them in an X, Y. So like this, pointed towards the band. Um, you know, if you go high, you're probably gonna get a ton of cymbals, you go low, you'll get a bit more low end and maybe the kick drum and just mess around, move around until you find a, a, a position that sounds really good. If it's a big, big room, then moving up or down two feet is not gonna make any difference. But if it's a smaller room, you will notice quite a difference between the mics being up here and the mics being low down. If you've got a binaural head, totally expensive, you probably not, haven't got that, you'd find the same position where it sounds good and record that way. You know, I've done it, like I said, with Walkmans, I've done it with boomboxes when I was a kid, and I've done it with laptops, like we're talking about, and a pair of mics. Um, there's all kinds of ways of working. If you've got nice microphones, you've got something like a pair of, you know, a matched pair of large diaphragm condensers, you could do a bloom line, which means taking the capsule, two capsules, and putting them head to head, and then twisting them, and then you can either, probably we'd leave them in figure of eight, so you're picking up front and back, which would be, could be really nice, or you could just use them in cardioid and just get the front. But if you go into a figure of eight pattern, you'll get all of the ambience of the room as well as the direct sound. Now obviously most of it's gonna be direct and super loud and pointed at you, but a little bit of ambience behind can be quite nice. So there's all kinds of fun ways of doing it. And please, you know, everybody share your experiences of recording bands live with a limited amount of mics. Now, 
if it's really the question is more about like what are the best ways to mic the room well you could do that anyway you could do um, a bloom line you could do an xy and then you could just use that and put reverb on it and it will you know make the auditorium even bigger the room even bigger if that's what it is you're trying to just create room mics however if you really are just trying to pick up only ambience then miking the walls is pretty nice technique if there's a wall get the reflected sound off the wall. You'll get a huge sound that way. I've done that in my old studio. I used to mic the walls, the left and right, and the drums sounded massive like that. It was such a great way of working. Now, if it's also wanting to have something accurate, um, but of the crowd, then you can go up to the stage and point the mics directly at the crowd. You've probably watched live recordings where you see mics pointing from the stage, and you're probably wondering why are they pointing mics out towards the crowd? It's so they can record the crowd chanting, clapping, singing along, all of that kind of stuff for a live recording, probably for a video or at least a live album or some live material. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways of doing this. It's a lot of fun. I highly recommend recording live bands and mixing them. It's actually quite a big business opportunity for many of you. Um, for the longest time, some of the biggest bands I got to work with were because I would record and mix live material. My live re resume is pretty darn good. You know, like I say, from Joe Strummer, the Chili Peppers, the Ramones, you know, I did a lot of live recording and Black Veil Brides more recently. And it, it's, it's good for the resume because it gets you involved with working with bands. Um, and so I highly recommend it. Do you have an opinion on continually variable phase adjustment for drums versus your time adjusting? I, I think what you're hinting at is a lot of really amazing plugins where you can analyze you know all of the drum mics and then adjust the phase accordingly i have tried doing that and what tends to happen when everything becomes like exactly phase coherent is the drums don't go boom ka they kind of go duk gat they get very short that those ones those big fat hits don't sound as fat um i don't mind hearing some things later as long as they aren't messing with the phase. So the question is, is like, how do you really think about that? Well, for me, it's like, if I'm delaying three mics, so I've got three mics on a kick drum and I delay the inside and the medium mic to the outside mic, I'm only delaying it by milliseconds at the most samples, a handful of samples, maybe like 50 or 100 samples to get all three to be in phase and the polarity to be good. And that can be really super powerful. Now, I don't bother worrying about my overheads being in phase with my kick perfectly because I'm not going to have the super, super low end of the overheads in my mix. So it's not going to affect the low end of the kick. If There would be some cancellation if I had tons of low end in my overheads and I pushed it up. I might get some cancellation. I might get some thinning of the kick. But I'm going to high pass that out of the overheads. However, I'm leaving enough body in my overheads to get the cymbals to feel good that the snare is going to matter. So I will time align my snare top with my overheads, which are in phase with my snare. I like the way that sounds. To me, that makes it, that adds a little bit more body on the snare. Now, I'm only doing those things usually. So when I see the plugins and I watch people like time aligning every element of the drums, it tends to sound thinner and a little excessive. You know, I'm going to be EQing things quite dramatically that won't have low end cancellation. However, if it works for you, that's really the bottom line and you can get great sounding drums, then do it that way. Hundreds of thousands of records that we grew up listening to didn't have that kind of technology, and yet we still love the drum sounds. What they did is they used very few mics, so they had less phase issues. Um, that's number one. And secondly, they weren't trying to like get drums to cut through, um, you know, a wall of 16 stacks of guitars aside. It wasn't like square wave guitars. And, you know, it was Zeppelin, some of the best drum sounds, but, you know, much tinier guitar sounds, sometimes even acoustic. It wasn't like Metallica plus wall of guitars. So, you know, there's different tolerances. It's, it's horses for courses. It's knowing about what are you going to do? If you're going to mix a very open, classic rock sounding drum kit with just like one or two guitar parts, you can get away with, you know, not so many mics and having less issues with phase to worry about. 
But if you've got a ton of metal, like huge walls of guitars and synths and stuff, those drums have to be super phase coherent and you really, really need control, individual control of the kick and snare to the nth uh, uh, you know, degree, not a three mic Glyn Johns technique. I mean, it's you're, you're not going to have the individual control that you need. Hence why people end up using samples, because the, the, the guitar sounds get so massive and you go and listen to modern rock and it's just a, a lot of the same kick and snare samples are getting used um, because they're trying to cut through these massive walls of guitars and walls of synths. Anyway, offered a bit of a tangent there, but I think whatever works for you as far as phase aligning, if you want to use one of those um, drum align tools to do it, you know, go do it. I think I, I, I don't you find it necessary in what I do, but if it works for you and it's quicker for you and you get good results really quickly, then I highly applaud it. And I think that's what you should try. When it comes to recording quality, is a good audio interface or microphone more important to get that radio ready sound? I think it depends on your interface. If, you, if you're just using um, like a 15 or 20 year old interface, like one of the early, no disrespect, but one of the early M boxes or Digi 001s, you know, from like late 90s, early 2000s, then yes, the, the interface is going to make a huge difference. We did a whole video on this a little while ago and talked about, you know, how if you buy something in the last couple of years, your average interface is one over here, like this. Here's an audience interface. You know, it's hundreds of dollars. It's not thousands and thousands of dollars. You can make a record on that. You know, you just have to be careful not to hit it too hard and distort the mic pre, you know, just, you can make a record on it. So as long as you're working with reasonable quality stuff, um, you should be fine. So will the microphone make a difference? Yes, it will. It'll make a huge difference. The, the two biggest differences are very, very old digital equipment compared with modern digital equipment. Cheap modern digital equipment is 10 times better than some of the stuff we were using 25 years ago. Maybe not the lowest level stuff, but in that sort of couple of hundred dollars range, it's amazing what you can get now. Now, as far as microphones are concerned, I think a decent priced condenser is worth its weight in gold. It doesn't have to be, you know, $15,000 vintage microphone. You know, the $500 to $1,000, there's a lot of incredible microphones. And we've been using microphones that were, you know, $149 on vocals. You know, some of the lower level price range, uh, lower level Lewitt microphones are phenomenal value for money. And there are other manufacturers as well. Audio Technica make great microphones that are inexpensive. So, you know, it's arguable what is a good microphone these days. I think obviously $500 to $1,000 gives you lots of choice, but there are gems in that sort of like 100 to 300 price range. And there's some really great microphones out there which will give you incredible results. It's a whole different world to the one I grew up in. The one I grew up in, um, the only affordable, it wasn't even that cheap, condenser was a AKG C1000S. And I fired one of those up a couple of years ago and I and, and compared it against like a Rode NT1. I mean, it, yeah, that was the only thing you could choose in those days. Um, and now there are so many incredible microphones like companies like Lewitt and, and you know, Audio Technica and loads of other companies are just making wonderful microphones at very incredibly affordable prices. So, you know, if you're asking me which one to get, the question would be, do you have a really, really old interface? If so, get a more modern interface. The next question is, is like, do you have at least, you know, a decent high-ish level, mid-level quality microphone? Then you're gonna be fine. You can make incredible records for just a few hundred dollars worth of gear. When you send stems out, do you remove any automation? There is the interesting thing. You mean tracks, don't you? You're saying when you send tracks out, do I remove any automation? If somebody is really wants my session, they can have everything on it. It's going to be pretty useless to them because our sessions are mixed hybrid. Sometimes we mix entirely in the box, but most of the time when we're making album albums, we're mixing hybrid. So we're going in the box or hybrid. In the box, I could give them a full session and everything would 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 recall. If that's what they want, that's what they get. But if I give them a session for mixing through a console, it's just not going to work. There's if there is any automation, it's going to be meaningless. 
because it's hitting the dynamics on the console. So um, I don't mind. If somebody really, really wants my session, then I make sure I got paid, you know, and, you know, I try to have a good feel for what is the, why do they want it? Obviously, if they want it just to like open it up themselves and tweak it and remix it and say that they mixed it, I mean, that's not cool if it happens to you, but it's our business. It will it's what happens all the time, you know. Um, these days, you know, professional mixers are asking for the full sessions of all the plugins, all the automation and everything. And then they're opening it up and tweak a few things and, and charge you to mix the song. I mean, that's the business we're in. But, you know, if it's your production and your band, you're playing to win. So you want to help the process along. Now, as far as stem stems, not tracks, but stems, then I think, um, honestly, you know, the automation when I'm printing out stems, like stereo files, is definitely going to be on there because it needs to stack up when you take like stereo drums, stereo guitars, stereo keyboards, background vocals, bass and lead vocal. When those elements are all put together, all the automation has to be written into the stereo files so that it sounds like the song. But I think you mean step, when you say stems, you mean tracks. And so for tracks, yes, I'll give them the automation. As like I said, it's not going to help them if I mix it through in a, in a hybrid on a console. Um, but yes, I mean, if they want, want, they want the tracks, they want the tracks. That's just part of our business. Um, you know, it used to be you put up a two inch tape on a console, put all the faders at zero, and it sounded like the record. So it's kind of the digital equivalent of that. Okay. Thank you ever so much for watching. Um, please check out the Aspen Pittman video. He was a great, great guy. He was incredibly um, important to the music industry. And I don't know, watch the video, you'll just see what a character. How much charisma did this guy have? He had a personality larger than any room he was in. All right, have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please leave any comments and questions below, and I will talk to you all again very soon. Have a marvelous day.